www.ctchurch.com We are conquering this mountain one step at a time. We cannot give up. We cannot back down. We cannot step aside and allow everyone else to do it for us. From Luke 4 and Isaiah 61, we know that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because He has anointed us to preach the Gospel to the poor. He has sent us to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to comfort all who mourn, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joyful mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Join hands with us today as we change the world one woman at a time. Describe it, but I can contain it. Come on. 
to the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who are we talking about? That's my king. Come on. Give him the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who are we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who are we talking about? That's my king. 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 King of kings. That's my king. Who are we talking about? That's my king. Who are we talking about? That's my king. Who are we talking about? That's my king. salvation one doorway that leads to life one redemption one confession i believe in the name of jesus christ come on hey come on let's sing i believe i believe in the crucifixion by his blood i have been set free i believe Resurrection, hallelujah, his life is destiny. Three, four. All praise to God the Father, and all praise to Christ the Son, and all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who Father, all praise to Christ the Son, 
I want you all just to lift your hands quickly in this place. Just lift your hands. Those watching online, lift your hands. Father, we don't want to come leave this place the same way in which we came in. We want your spirit to touch us, to transform us, We want you to move past reason and intellect, man's understanding. We want you to captivate us, Father. That is my prayer for each and every person 
under the sound of my voice, that they will be captivated by your love, by your goodness, by your grace and your mercy. That, Father, we would leave this place totally transformed, on fire, unashamed, unapologetic about Jesus Christ. We welcome you here, Father. Move past our struggles, move past our distractions, move past our irritations this morning. And we ask you to be glorified in us and through us. So come, Holy Spirit. Fall upon us, we pray. Fall upon our city, we pray. Fall upon our nation, we pray. Fall upon our young people, we pray. Fall upon our schools, we pray. Fall upon our universities, we pray. Fall upon our companies and our industries, we pray. Come like rain, Father, and flood South Africa. Flood our nation. Flood our people from the townships to the suburban areas. Fall, we pray. We pray that you would fall in every church across this nation this morning in the name of Jesus. this morning and we get the sound right and I hope you can hear me out there but listen we cannot have a move of God without God we can have all the smarts and all the sharps but without God we've got nothing bring my sound down please without God we've got nothing nothing we need God to move and God moves through his people that set themselves aside that come to worship Him and trust Him and believe that He will transform their lives because one believer and God make a majority. You will transform that school. If you are really trusting God, you're believing with faith, you will transform that school. You will transform that university. You will transform that company. You will transform that suburb. You will transform that place wherever you are. I promise you, if you're really touched by God, things change. But we can't just be praying and not doing, and we can't just be doing and not praying. For a move of God, we need God. We need God. We need God. Come on, lift your hands. Father, we pray this morning that you will move in our lives, that you will move through our lives, that overflow will come, and it will come through us, Father. We pray this morning for a move of God, starting this morning in our church, starting this morning, Father, in our lives, that will cause us to be bold, that will cause us to be available, that will cause us to be hungry for your presence. Father, we ask you in this critical hour to do what only you can do in and through us in the mighty name of Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, just say with me. Say, God, 
I'm here for you. Touch me. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen. Come on, while we're standing, let's just welcome everybody. CRC Richards Bay, YouTube, Faith TV, all those watching on Facebook Live this morning. Come on, we welcome you. And those that are in here this morning in this house, we welcome you. We trust God will touch you. I can't welcome when I can't hear. I welcome you and I trust God will move in your life. Just greet one or two people. Tell them they're looking fantastic. And uh, every week this place is getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And we're going to see God move. But we want to move of God with God. We want to move of God with God. We want to move of God with God. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open them so long to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11. Can you hear me good out there? Can you? Great. Because I can't hear me good up here, but it's fine. Mark chapter 11. Last week, you remember, I started talking a series, or speaking, preaching a series on your perspective matters. And I talked about Caleb and how he had a victorious mindset, a, a, a belief in God, which is really faith in God. Because faith is simply defined as what you really believe. So if God says it, that settles it. If God says, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God. As a Christian, that's what you believe. Simple. You can't go negotiate it. And I respect everybody else that believes something else. But I don't necessarily agree. Because as a born again believer, I believe the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Meaning Jesus. I believe that. So I'm not going to be ashamed about it. And so when God spoke to, 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 to Caleb, he believed. We are well able. The other spies said, no, no, there are giants in the land. There are problems in the land. There's this problem. There's that problem. But, but Caleb believed God. Caleb believed what God said and embraced it. He had the faith, faith in God that, that changed his perspective. And so I want to say to you, it's never too late to come back to God. It's never too late to come back to His presence, to His promises, and to His purpose for your life. So I want to talk about it, and I want to mingle two things. I want to talk about faith and forgiveness. Because without faith, we cannot please God, Hebrews eleven six. And it's going to take faith to pursue the things of God. It's going to take faith to do what God has called us to do. And so this morning, Hebrew, uh, Hebrews... That's who makes the coffee in a Christian home, Hebrews. My sermon title this morning is Let It Go. Let go of all unbelief. Let go of wrong thinking and, and wrong perspectives. Let go of anything that hinders your relationship with God. I mean, I love what the Bible talks about when it says Moses was a murderer. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Peter denied God. Jonah ignored God. Saul persecuted Christians. Abram committed adultery. Who's to say you're too far gone? That's just a lie from the enemy. Because God is in the business of turning evil to good. Brings death, brings life to dead things and makes beauty from ashes. It's never too late for a comeback. So let it go. This is a critical message for all of us. Because we are in a rebuilding phase, rebuilding our lives, rebuilding the city. In Mark chapter 11, verse 12, Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Who was he? He was Jesus. Here's some good news. Jesus gets hungry. He was fully God, yet fully man. He had the same emotions, the same feelings, the same hunger that you and I have. He was hungry. And seeing from afar, I can relate to Jesus now. And seeing from afar a fig tree, Having leaves, he went to see if perhaps, why? Because he's hungry. If perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, You are a beautiful fig tree. Just keep on blossoming leaves. Because he's Jesus, right? And we have a religious picture of Jesus. 
man with long brown hair. Pale complexion, really. Floating around in a, in a white dress all over the place. And he's, he's like Jesus. And he's got this permanent smile on his face. And, and, and he's never got... We've got that kind of impression of Jesus. This perfect person who's never hungry. And, and I mean, he could have got the fig tree to produce a fig by just speaking to it because he's Jesus. But, but he goes to this fig tree to get some fruit from that fig tree because he's hungry and he, it's out of season. It's not the time for a fig tree to produce figs. And he walks up to it and there's no fig on it. And in response, he says, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. That's sometimes not the Jesus I, I, I should have imagined that I was taught about in Sunday school. I mean, really, Jesus, it's out of season. Just be nice to the fig tree. In response, Jesus said to him, did no one eat fruit from you ever again? And his disciples heard it. Then he goes and cleans, cleans out the temple because they're gambling in the temple. The sweet Jesus we talk about, he's, he's, he's passionate. He's zealous for the things of God. He sees a, a, the temple out of order. But sometimes people don't understand our personalities because we're passionate about the things of God. When things aren't in order, sometimes our, our demeanor in our face changes a little bit. And people go, oh, look at Pastor Lynn. He's, oh, look, oh, how can he? Oh. No, because we're passionate about the things of God. I wonder how you would have stood around Jesus seeing how he was. He, he, he cusses a, a fig tree because it's got no fruit and it's out of season. And then from there, he's, he's not having a good day, really. He goes into the church and he throws everybody out and he turns over the tables of the money uh, dealers, etc., etc., etc. Sweet Jesus. And then it goes on in verse 20. Now we're talking about the second part of the story of the fig tree. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembering, what do you remember? How Jesus cursed it. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, look, they're shocked. The tree which you cursed has withered away. I mean, he didn't just say, man, may you never be fruit again. He spoke so strong and so stern that the fig tree became withered from its roots, dried up. And Jesus answered to them and said, have faith in God. Have the God kind of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says faith is now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is now. Now faith is. Faith is now. Faith, what, what you speak is, is revealing your faith. What you speak, what, what, what comes out of the, the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks, that's your faith. And listen, let me tell you, we're going to have to start speaking faith over our nation. We're going to have to start speaking faith over our city. We're going to have to start speaking faith, the God kind of faith, not the negative faith. We're going to have to start saying what God says. We're going to have to start speaking what God says about the people around us. We're going to have to start speaking what God says about our children, about our children's schools, about our companies we work for, about the businesses that we own. We're going to have to start saying what God says. And the only way to do what God does is to get in a line with what, who God is. So Jesus answered and said, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, this battle, this struggle, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Here's an interesting statement that you should listen to. Faith will work in your heart even with doubt in your head. Do you think when you're building something, when you're raising some kids, when you are studying, when you are working in a company and you've got a great vision, that you're not going to face challenges, that you're not going to face doubts, that you're not going to face battles? Listen, faith can work in your heart 
while the enemy is doubting in your head. And you've got to tell your head to, to, to keep quiet. You've got to tell your mind to be still because you've got to declare what God says about you. And every one of us end up struggling in a place when we succumb to doubt, when we succumb to fear, when we succumb to the battles that we are facing in this present world. Has Durban got a future? Yes, if the Christians would rise up and declare and the Christians would rise up and do and the Christians would rise up and be the difference we need in our world instead of bunkering down. Believe in your heart. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Faith is a spiritual force. So we need to understand the basic concept of faith. And the basic concept of faith is always going to be in conflict with this world. Always. It's always going to be in conflict with this world. That's why our attitude is so critical. That's why when we come to church every Sunday, we should be coming with this expectation. We should be coming with this hunger. We come and saying, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you going to say? I don't care what the sermon title is. I don't care what scripture the pastor is preaching from. But you've set me in this house. I'm coming to hear from you. And I'm listening for the word upon the word. I'm listening for the revelation upon the Logos. I'm listening for the rhema, the revealed word upon the Logos. I'm not going to succumb to my culture. I'm not going to succumb to my tradition. I'm not going to succumb to my upbringing. I'm coming to hear from God. I'm coming to worship God. I'm coming to hear from God. I'm coming to bring my world to God. That's what the church is about yeah so this last week we celebrated with CRC Kimberley as they opened up their new facility beautiful facility on the Cape Town side of Kimberley a dream that has been in the making for something like um, um, I don't want to get it wrong now but almost 30 years Now they've walked into it. People go, wow, where did that come from? No, no, it's a 30-year dream. Habakkuk 2 says, write down the vision, make it plain that he may run and read it. It shall come to pass. Though it tarries, it shall come to pass. Though it tarries, it shall come to pass. Pastor Henny originally had that dream almost 30 years ago. Now it's manifested under the leadership of Pastor Brian, and he's done brilliantly. And we celebrated with him in Kimberley. You see, the challenge is that there's a fight for your future. There's a fight for the future of your children. There's a fight for the future of your children's children. And you and I are either going to have to be the Christian that engages and uses their faith for the future or the Christian that sits back and says, where's God? I made a statement a few weeks, maybe a month or so back about how as parents, you can't just sit back and wait for school governing bodies and an education system to to. to, to, to better your kid's future. You've got to get on the school governing body. I heard last week that one of our members got on the school governing body. And now they're opening doors for us to to come and preach in the schools and opening the doors for us to come and have home cells in that school. You see, that's the kind of faith we're going to have to use. We can't just sit back. We can't just try and be popular. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. We're here to transform the lives of people. And we are the agents that God uses to change people. So this last week, we were in Kimberley for for two days. And I really believe God spoke to me about certain things. Of some of those things I will share with you this morning. But while we were there, I felt on my heart that, number one, I must go and see the man that led me to Christ. Led me to Christ on the 7th of November, 1994. So Alice and I went and and we sat with this pastor who led me to Christ. Listen, I want you to hear this. In his office. Not in a church environment. Not with this amazing praise and worship. In a cold office at the back of the church. I'll never forget that day. I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate. He made me sit on a, on, on a couch like this. And then him and another guy called John knelt in front of me. I didn't feel goosebumps. As I looked at these two grown men kneeling in front of me, I thought, this is weird. And I burst out laughing. 
And they both stood up and said, what's so funny? I said, if my friends could see me now. Because imagine if my friends could see me now. Imagine what they would say if they could see me now. And the truth be known, for seven months I had been wrestling because I had a little bit of success in sport and I had a little bit of success in business and I made a little bit of money and I thought I was something, but in actual fact I was empty as you can be and I was crying out and I was searching and I was asking, where's God, is God real, etc. for about seven months. And when they asked me the question, do you still want to give your life to Jesus? I said, most definitely. Most definitely. So they knelt again and prayed the sinner's prayer. I can't remember remember the exact words but I do remember saying Jesus come into my life forgive me of all my sins and I do remember the peace I experienced I do remember the weight of guilt and shame that was lifted off my shoulders I do remember that I had an encounter with God that was so real that it transformed my life that 30 years later I'm still passionate 30 years later I still believe the truth about God's word 30 years later I still want to preach the gospel wherever I go I still want Jesus to touch people through me why? because he touched me 30 years ago you need to get your faith back I mean we live in a world that is confused a world that is in chaos and if you're a Christian longer than three seconds you should know that God is not the author of this chaos but God can use this chaos to reset things in our lives God spoke to me. It was obviously little incidences that, that, that made me think in a different direction. And one of them was that a young guy that I knew, well, not so young anymore, but, but he was very young at the time that I knew him, died in a car accident about a month, six weeks ago. A guy that I used to play cricket with his brother and his father, actually. His father was ending his career and I was starting my career. Let me just clarify that. His father's over 20 years older than me. And, uh, he used to stand around the side of the, of the cricket field. Died in a car accident at the age of 41. And, and God triggered something in me. Then we happened to be in Kimberley for the opening of the building. And God began to talk to me. And started reminding me about people who were significant, who played a significant part or who were a significant part of my life. And the question was, do they know Jesus? I spent several years in Kimberley. It's where I gave my life to the Lord. And I decided, hang on, while I'm there, I'm going to go on a mission and meet up with people from my past. And let me tell you why. And let me tell you an important statement here. Because those people might be the only, the, the, my life might be the only reflection of Jesus that some of them will ever see. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, that they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own li their, 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 their lives to, to, to the death. They overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So I'm saved. I believe in God. I, I'm, I'm pushing my faith to do things for God. But the greatest thing I can do for God is to tell others about Jesus. Some of them had observed my life. And so we had lunch at a place called Hassar Grill. That's important. I'm, I'm telling you stories this morning. Maybe it's more stories. And somebody say, it wasn't a deep teaching. It wasn't deep. I want, I, want, I, want, I want you to get this. So we go to this restaurant called Hassar Grill. And we arrive there. And Hassar Grill is known other than the pub that I used to frequent. 30 years ago. I walk in and I had visions of this pub that was filled with 10,000 people one night, but it wasn't. It couldn't fit more than 100 people. And I walked in and the original bar counter is still there. Now, I've got to explain this to you. So I walked up to the bar counter and I leant on the bar counter like I used to do 30 years ago. The first thing that shocked me was the manager of the restaurant walked up to me and he said, I know you. And I thought, 
which one of me did you know? He says, you see, I see Pastor Glenn, right? I said, that's right. I thought, thank you, Jesus. And then he went on to say, at the back of our shop, we've still got a picture of you. You're not allowed in here. I said, what do you mean? He says, I know all about you. I know your past and I know your present. And I said, thank God he knows my future. He said, your life is transformed, isn't it? I said, you're right. As I'm leaning on the counter, another pastor walks in and he takes a picture of me. He wanted to send it on social media to people. I said, no, no, no. But as I stood there, I remembered an incident in that bar. 30 years ago, the 31st of December, 1994, I'd been saved for just over a month. And the guy that was the captain of our cricket side, our provincial cricket side, had moved the previous season to play cricket in Boerland. And he came back that December on holiday. And he came with his wife to stay with me. And he said, what are we going to do on New Year's Eve? I said, we're going to bry at home. He said, no, I want to catch up with all our old friends. I said, no, listen, Mike, I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke anymore. I don't go and frequent those places anymore. I gave my life to Jesus. And he said, it's great that you gave your life to Jesus. And it's fine if you don't drink no more. And it's fine if you don't smoke no more. But the reality is I want to connect with our friends. Let's go. I said, I don't want to go. And eventually after an argument, he said, we can go together and you don't have to drink. I said, okay. And I went there uncomfortable. I had given my life on the 7th of November and now the 31st of December. I'm in a place that I used to frequent for the wrong reasons. And I stood at that bar counter. I'll never forget it, like yesterday. It was about 10 o'clock at night. The place was packed, chock-a-block. My vision always was it was 10,000 people, but the truth was it couldn't hold more than 100 people. But it was chock-a-block. And I stood next to the till. There was an NSRI little plastic boat, which was actually a money box, and you could put your change in that boat. And I stood there, and a friend of mine standing next to me kept asking me, why am I not drinking? Because there were about five Coke cans in front of me, because you can drink Coke very slowly. You can drink the other stuff quicker, but the Coke just bloats you and bloats you. I'm still feeling a bit bloated from 30 years ago. Why aren't you drinking? I looked at him and said, Lumbro, no, no, no. No, that's not in the mood. And he kept on. His wife now, his girlfriend at the time, Tracy, turned around and said, leave him, man, leave him. He said, no, I heard a rumor about you. I thought, another one. He said, I heard you, you one of these happy, clappy, born again types. Is that why you're not drinking? And I stood in that place like this. Mm. Mm. And he asked again. And about the third time he asked, it felt like the whole pub had, had, had gone quiet and they were all looking at me. I was a Christian for a month and a half and I could just hear a scripture in my head. One scripture. If you deny me before man, Matthew chapter 10. If you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. And I looked at him. I said, yes. I'm born again. Jesus forgave me of my sins. I now have a future. And I'll never forget, these guys started taking change out their pockets. And, and I mean, the NSRI boat made so much money that night. If we put money in here, are we going to go to heaven? I said, no, unless you are born again, unless you give your heart to Jesus Christ. And you know what? I walked out of that place 10.30 that night, walked to my house, left all my friends. I had the biggest peace. Why? Because I was not ashamed of Jesus. What am I trying to say to you? Oh, come on, CRC. What am I trying to say to you? We can't be complacent with the testimony God's given us. We can't be complacent with the love of God that He's shown towards us. We can't be complacent in our walk with God. There's got to come a time where we wake up to the reality that we are called to be God's ambassadors here on on earth we call to be radical unashamed Christians because here's the truth here's the truth your life and your testimony 
might be the only reflection of Jesus that your family, that your friends, that other people will ever see. Listen, I'm trying to get to a point, And the point that I'm trying to get to this morning is there is power in your testimony. It might not be a dirty testimony like mine, but there's power in your testimony. Each one of you has a testimony. I was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, now I see. Oh, come on, somebody who's got saved, whose blood was blood bought by the Lamb of God, jump to your feet this morning and give Him some praise. Somebody that's born again, just remind yourself what God has done. Remind that you may not be where you were, and you want to be, but you're not where you were. Oh, come on, jump to your feet. Oh, come on, you've got a testimony. You've got a testimony. God has saved you. We forget what God has done. We forget what God has done. There's power in your testimony because there's power in salvation. And we've got to be unashamed. And Paul writes in Romans 1, 16, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. How powerful and impactful is your testimony? I mean, I made a decision. I said, I'm going to tell everybody that I remember that I played sport with, that I partied with, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. One guy that never liked me when I was in the world who we shared our testimony with, his daughter is a young person serving in the church in Kimberley. Somebody else who I played cricket with, who was sometimes the ringleader of all the parties, his daughter came into the lounge after the service and greeted me. I'm Pete's daughter. I'm not saying it was directly because of my testimony, but it was because of somebody else's testimony. So I decided to phone these people. I phoned Pete. There was a song that he was infamous for. He hasn't got my number. I phoned him. I said, hi, Pete. He goes, hello. I just say the song's name. He goes, Glenn Schroeder. I said, hey, Pete, my life's changed. Next time I'm in Kimberley, let's get together. I went to go and visit the father of who, the, 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 the young man that died. I went to go and visit his father, a man that I played cricket with. We spent half an hour outside his business talking, my wife with me, talking about how God had transformed my life. We saw many different people because I'm on a mission. There are people of your past and people that maybe have done things to you, but your walk with God, your faith in God is the key to their salvation. Maybe it's your parents that will hear about Jesus, the real Jesus, for the first time because of your radical serving God. The radical transformation in your life. There's power in your testimony. And it's going to take faith to share. I found people that are international cricket coaches now and told them about Jesus. And in actual fact, I reminded myself that there's many times I went back to cricket players over the years who I've told about Jesus. Led one or two of them to Christ and because of the culture that they live in, they slid away from God and have moved away from God, but now I'm making it my mission to bring them back to God. Because there's two things, the power of your testimony. And the second thing I want to touch on this morning is the power of forgiveness. Because some of those people didn't like me then. And because they didn't like me, or my perception was that they didn't like me, I was maybe hesitant when I saw them to share the gospel. Because they hurt me. And I realize I have to forgive. I have to forgive. When I was 17 years old, I damaged my knee badly in a rugby match. 
and I had my first knee operation. I've had eight knee operations because of that incident. But a severe knee injury in which resulted in my first surgery at the age of 17. And after I was released from hospital, I was, I was lying at home to recover and something was wrong with where they operated and I had plaster of Paris in those years from here to literally just my toe nail sticking out. And my leg was like this. And one morning I got up and the pain was so bad that as I stood up, I passed out. And they called an ambulance and rushed me back to hospital. Here's the interesting thing I learned about life. The orthopedic surgeon wasn't too concerned about the pain that I was in. His concern was the lack of circulation in my leg. His concern was what was it that was stopping the blood flow in my leg. For him, it was about the blockage. He knew the pain would go. He knew the swelling would come down. He knew the leg would heal when the blood is flowing. What is stopping the blood from flowing? Same with a heart attack. If you have a heart attack, you worry about the pain. But the doctors are worried about the blockage. Because what they want is the blood to flow again. And when we talk about sharing the gospel, when we talk about using our faith, when we talk about the things that God wants to do in and through our lives, and some people are in year after year, church Sunday after church Sunday, and they seem stagnant, maybe there is something that is blocking the flow. Well, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. No more than that. What's blocking the flow? I want us to be honest this morning. What's hindering us in our relationship with God? We came to Christ. We gave our life to Jesus. But what's hindering? Not God's Word. Not God's promises. Not God's intended future for each and every one of us. Some of us are holding on to our past. Some of us aren't renewing our minds. Some of us are holding on to unforgiveness. Some of us are holding on to bitterness. And that is controlling and hindering our faith. Because the reality is there's power in love and forgiveness. I mean, I look how lives can be transformed. One of the guys I met up with this last week, a very good friend of mine, was in our church over Easter. When we were unsaved, I used to wake up in his back garden. Factual. One Sunday when I was preaching, just after I got saved, he literally almost jumped over the pews to give his life to Jesus. Un unbelievable how one life touches another life and both lives are changed. One life touches another life, potentially the whole world is changed. Now we look at his life 28 years later, it's to on a totally different trajectory. All his kids are serving God. But yet we could have lived with unforgiveness. We could have lived with bitterness. We could have lived with, with shame and guilt that we didn't want to talk to people and didn't want to be honest with people and didn't want to share the gospel with people. Listen, we've got to use our faith every day in every area of our lives. Because the enemy is going to come and whisper. The enemy is going to come and lie. The enemy is going to come and cause doubt. The enemy is going to come and cause bitterness. The enemy is going to come and cause unforgiveness. And it ends up hindering us from what God has called us to do. We were in a conference two weeks ago where we, we heard a guy speak and, and, and he touched on, 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 on forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. And I thought back to the story about my knee. What is the blockage? The doctor's not worried about the pain. He's not worried about the swelling because he's worried about the blockage. And he knows if he can get rid of the blockage, the healing will take place. I mean, God gives us a commandment. The greatest commandment. They ask him, teacher, 
Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment for us is to love the Lord, is to really love God, which means we say, God, here is my life. I surrender it to you. God, speak to me through the power of your living word. God, whatever you say, I surrender, spirit, soul, and body. I'm now going to live for you, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't, uh, my mind doesn't understand it. My culture doesn't understand it. I'm going to yield myself to you. And in yielding yourself to God, you're going to feel resistance. You're going to feel opposition. You're going to feel people telling you, no, listen, it doesn't work that way. And you're going to hear, oh, because why? It wants to stop you from this. People will tell us that this country doesn't have a future. I say, excuse me, read your Bible. This country's got a great future. Our children have a great future. Our children's children have a great future. Why? Because children of God are going to believe the Word and we're going to change the world that we're living in. We're going to change our world. We're going to influence our world. We're going to make our world a better place. We're going to see many others come to Christ. We're going to transform the things that need to be transformed. We're going to pray for Christians to rise up in politics. We're going to pray for Christians to rise up in government. We're going to pray for Christians to fix the schools and to fix our education system. We're going to pray. And not only are we going to pray, we're going to get up and be the agents of change that God has called us to be. We're going to get engineers who are going to fix our roads and fix our electricity and fix our systems. And we're going to see a better country for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Not people that are paralyzed by fear, bitterness of what has happened to them. He says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. So if the first is this and the second is like it, it means the first and the second are the same. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor. as yourself. Keaton, come here. Mac, come here. Come here. Who's somebody of Indian descent? Come here. Somebody that's been labeled an Indian, come here. Somebody who's been labeled an Indian, come here please, I need somebody of Indian descent to run to the front, quickly. Not difficult, thank you, great. Come stand here. Stand, come close, don't be so scared, we're gonna bite, there, there. Come a little bit closer, there, there. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Not just neighbors that look a little bit like you. But neighbors that don't look so much like you, he, his body looks like mine. <laughs> his guns look like mine. But he's my neighbor because God's brought him into my life. You shall love your neighbor. If you love God, you'll love your neighbor. If you love God, you'll love your neighbor. Each one. I'm better because we've got neighbors of different labels. Of course, this is only a label. In actual fact, he's not whatever they want to label him at. He's a Christian. And he's not whatever they want to label him. He's a Christian. And she's not whatever they want to label him. She's a Christian. And he's not whatever they want to label him because he's also a Christian. Because when you love God, you don't look at the outward appearance of man. When you love God, you look at people and you realize people, people. God sent his son to die on the cross 
for people, every race, every culture. And the moment that you're born again, you lay aside your culture. You now become a Christian. The label put upon you is child of God, son and daughter of the Most High God. That's who you are. You are a child of God. You're a son and daughter of the Most High God. You're not this label. You're not that label. You're not this person's label. You are a child of the Most High God. And that's our challenge. That's our challenge. How are we going to cause revival in the city? To love people. How are you going to love people? Really love God. Respect your traditions. Respect your cultures. But when your cultures and your traditions violate the Word of God, throw that out. I still think it's good that if a lady walks in the room, you should stand. I was raised that way. I was raised in a way that you are courteous towards people. Good morning. How are you? Great to see you. Nice to see you. Bless you. You look great today. Thank you. Bless you. I think that's good. But when my tradition and my culture and my upbringing violates the Word of God, I'm tossing that out. I had somebody leave our church. Can you believe that? And their reason was they want to go to a church where there's more people like them. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest and the second are equal, to love God, to love people. And so with the death of this person, I knew I had to make a decision to walk in a different type of faith, to make it my mission to share my testimony with as many people that knew me and at the same time to walk in forgiveness towards people that hurt me, that did things that were wrong to me. Because sometimes that's the very thing that stops you sharing the gospel with them. And the few people that I came into contact with this last week, I realized some of them I had the wrong perception of. And when death comes, the issues that are very much the things that are holding us back aren't issues. Is there something blocking you? Is there something that's blocking the flow of God in your life? I'm over time. Because here comes my title that I'll try to get to in the beginning. Let it go. It's not worth it. We talk about have faith in God, Mark chapter 11. Have the God kind of faith. If you say to this mountain, be removed and cast and the seed will go. Blah, 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 blah. All you've got to do is believe, don't doubt in your heart. But often we leave out verse 25 and 26 and whenever you stand praying pray yeah it's fine let's say you pray pray and whenever you stand praying pray okay it's fine none of you are kneeling check none of them are kneeling but they all close their eyes and whenever you stand praying pretend you're praying If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Ladies, that was a good time to say amen. It doesn't say forgive her. So it means you're always right. No, that's a joke. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. 
faith can't work where unforgiveness exists. You see, family, the true mark of Christianity is to forgive the unforgivable. To love the unlovable. To touch the untouchable. And to bring close to God those whose society has cast it out. That's why it takes faith to live for God. That's why without God, we can't have a move of God. I want everybody to stand in this place. Stay here. Can just, stand, just move a little bit apart. Give it more space. I believe with all my heart that God wants to use our church to bring people of all races, all cultures, for a better word, different financial statuses, together. And for us to do that, we are going to have to love God and to love people. For us to do that, we're going to have to walk in love and forgiveness. Just bow your heads. Please, nobody moving around. You've come here this morning. You've come here this morning. Two things I want to work through. You've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. You've never given your life to Christ. You might know about Him, but you don't know Him personally. I want to give you an opportunity to give yourself back to God. I want to tell you that He loves you. And you're never too far gone. There's always a way back. But it starts by humbling yourself and saying, God, I need you. Maybe you're standing here today, you're saying, listen, pastor, I tried this thing, it didn't work. No, listen, my brother, my sister, when you fully surrender to God, I promise you He'll come and He'll work with you, but you've got to fully surrender. You've once given your life to Christ, you've wandered away. He wants you to come back to Him this morning. Maybe you don't have assurance of salvation. Maybe you're standing here today and truthfully, be honest, there's bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart towards people. Hey, we live in a crazy world where people do crazy things. And maybe you are a victim or somebody close to you is a victim of what somebody has done. Hey, we love God. We love people. And we can forgive people like God forgave us. And forgiving doesn't mean you're walking, letting people walk over you. It means you're letting it go. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, nobody's looking around, believers are praying. You've never given your heart to Jesus before. You have, but you've wandered away. Or you, 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 you're strangled by unforgiveness. You know you are truth. Just quickly slip up your hand high and say, yes, you're talking to me. Quickly, quickly. I want to pray for you. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you right at the back. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Many. Come on. Be honest. Be honest with God this morning. Be honest with yourself. We want to build something for the future. We have to let it go. Number one, we have to hold on to Jesus. Number two, we have to let people go. And it's almost impossible to forgive without receiving Jesus' love for you and His forgiveness. If you haven't yet raised your hand, do so now. Bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Quickly. Oh, over there. Many hands. Many. Thank you. Many. Thank you. Here in the front. Anybody else? Quickly. Come on. Slip it up. Pastor, you don't know what people have done to me. Bless you. You don't know what people have done to me. No, we, we've all had stories. And it's not right, but it's time to let go. It's time to forgive. It's time to move on. In Jesus' name. Last time I looked across the auditorium, you haven't yet raised your hand. Do so now quickly. Raise your hand high. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You put your hands down. Put your hands down. Thank you. 
You raised your hand. You should have raised your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in a prayer. So I'm going to ask you to pick up your personal belonging, step out of your chair. Doors are closed for safety and security reasons. Come on, we don't want to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. You come quickly. Come on, come. Come quickly. Come. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come on, come quickly. Come on. Many, 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 many. Come on, come, 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 come. Come on, come on, ma'am. Forgive your husband. Forgive your parent. Forgive your father. Forgive your auntie. Forgive your uncle. Forgive your brother. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, clap, clap, CRC. Come on. Many are coming. Come on. Say to that person, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. Come on, ushers. Come on. Pastors, work with me. Come on. There are many, many. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Give me This is a new day. Come on, out of that chair. Out of that chair. Come on. Come on. Come on. You raise your hand, should have raised your hand. Come. 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 There's still more. Come on, I'm fighting for you. Come on, God's wanting you to come. Come on. Your heart is Come on. Come on. You know, there's some of you older people. You're still holding a grudge against auntie so-and-so who's even dead and buried. And you're holding back what God wants to do in your life because there's a blockage. You cannot receive what God has for you without forgiving and letting go of other people. Listen to me. We've all had bad things. I can tell you story after story. And I'll cause you to weep and cry because you can't believe that your pastor actually went through some stuff. No, he went through a lot of stuff. Some were self-inflicted. Some was because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Some was just totally ungodly godly and evil. And I've had to learn to forgive. There were two guys in Kimberley that hated my guts. Hated my guts. If any opportunity they could get, they want to beat me up. When I got saved, one came to church, other one didn't come to church. But one night the one phoned me, two, three o'clock in the morning. Drunk as a skunk, said, listen, I need your help. I said, come. When you're sober, come, let's get together. Never came back. But I, I could minister to them because I forgave. And when the forgiveness comes, fear leaves you. There are some of you still staying in this place. You've got bitterness and unforgiveness. It's a root. Today's the day to come later to the altar. Today is to come and let them go. Because as you let them go, you go. You will experience a new freedom and a new peace and a new joy. I'm giving 30 seconds. I don't care who you are. But just be open to God this morning. God is speaking to you. There's a stirring in your heart. I don't care if you're a bishop, an apostle, a pastor, a billionaire, a pauper, whoever you are. It doesn't matter. Your faith will work when you forgive, when you let go and you receive His love, His forgiveness, His mercy. So come quickly, come. Come quickly, come. Come quickly, come quickly. What happened to you wasn't right, but come, 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 come. Come on, clap, CRC. Come on, there's still more. 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 Come, 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 come. Come on, forgiveness is powerful. Come home to the Father. Come on, come. Your heart is what is after. Surrender. Come on, man. There's a stirring in your heart that's God speaking to you. Come. 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 Come on, man. God loves you. Come. 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 If you're the only person I'm waiting for you, it's come. 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 
come. There's still more coming. Come on, come, 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 come. Come on, come on, come. Come on, forgive that person, man. So you can receive forgiveness. coming. Come on. Feel it here. Come, come. You feel the Lord. Come on, come. Come, come, come. Come on. Just smile at them, please. Don't give them a dirty look as if they're doing something wrong. Gee, you should be in the front. Come, we wait for you. We wait for you. We're not going to be selfish Christians because you don't know what somebody else has been through. And there's an incredible presence of God here. Because there's power in your testimony and there's power in forgiveness. God to a clock, but God doesn't want to be on a clock. Sometimes the service will last an hour, hour 20, hour 40, hour and a half. We work on God's time and we work with what God's doing. There are still people, I'm going to tell you now, there are at least five of you, and most of you are over the age of 25, that have got bitterness, unforgiveness in your heart, and you need to let go today so God can heal. I'm asking you to come now quickly because I'm telling you this is significant. You can feel it. As I'm talking, there's a stirring here. That's God talking. He's trying to nudge you. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Come. And if you're a pastor on staff, come. If you're a worship leader, come. Because you're hindering what God wants to do through your life. We're going to recommit ourselves and recommit ourselves to a future with God, to follow God, to run for God, to serve God to do what God's called us to do. I'm telling you now, there are people, if you're on the platform, get off the platform and get right with God because we can do all these things that look excellent without God in it. Get my sound right. We can do all these things with, 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 and, and that look spiritual. Do you know, every Saturday night, I repent. Every Saturday night, I say, God, if there's somebody I have to forgive, help me. Because we as pastors all the time have people say things about us. Lie. Sometimes close brethren and sister and say things about us and we have to just forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. People criticize the church. We miss. So, so I understand. I understand the power of forgiveness. And I understand the power of surrendering my life to Jesus. It's a moment. And please, when I say this, I'm not targeting anybody. Because sometimes you tell me your story and then now you think I'm specifically targeting you. No. One of the most important things we should do is forgive those around us, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a cousin, an auntie, an uncle. I recently had a conversation with my father. I'm closing with this. And I said this to him, Dad, we might see things differently. But I would never want you to go to your grave or I'd die before you. It's not going to happen. But where there's an unresolved issue, 
Because once a person is gone, we cannot resolve it. And you hold the key to that breakthrough. But if they forgive me, I'll forgive them. No, no. By you letting it go. You're letting it flow. I probably won't lead my dad to Christ, but I believe somebody else will. Is there anybody else that should be here? Come quickly. No clapping, nothing. Just come. And then we're going to pray. Do you still remember who you had to forgive? Who you had to let go? God loves you. God wants to heal you and set your whole life on a new course. Anybody else? You're taking more than enough time. Well, this is more than enough time for people. Just put your hand on your heart. We're all going to pray this prayer together. Those in the congregation, just lift your hands towards these people. Just say this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are the risen Christ who died and rose from the grave to give me life. And I surrender my life to your Lordship. And today, I choose to forgive all those who've wronged me. And I receive your forgiveness for my sin. I receive your peace, your love, and your promise of new life. I ask you to guide me, to guard me, to lead me, and now to use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. Listen, family, this is not just what we do as CRC, it's who we are. I'm asking you, the decision you've made is to forgive. The decision you've made is to embrace everything God has for you. He's in the business of restoring lives and He will restore your life. He takes nobodies and makes them into somebodies. He takes the ordinary and does something extraordinary with them. He takes the zeros. People have written us off and makes us into the heroes. Your life will transform. So just for a moment we want to pray with you whether it be a first time commitment, recommitment, whatever it is. If you would just be so kind to turn to your left, my right and follow Keaton, we'll show you. Come on. Come on, let's give him a great big hand clap this morning. Come on, give him a great big hand clap, man. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. This is what it's about, people. Reconnecting people to Jesus. Come on. Clap. Get excited. Pastor, you've taken up too much time. Good. 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 While you're still standing, we're not leaving now. Please be seated for a second. Thank you. Thank you. People criticize CRC because we lock the doors, and I see us are just not letting people out now. We lock the doors during the offering for our security and for our protection. We don't force you to give. We offer you the opportunity to...